Oh my, thank you, Willow. It is so good to be back here with you. What an honor to be with you at your celebration of hope time. Also, I'm so excited that, that we can share together and learn together. And <sighs> when, I think of, when I think of Willow, I, I just, I'm just excited to be back because I have so many wonderful memories here of being with you in Sunday weekend services, of Wednesday nights, of the summit itself. And there's a reason I think God loves Willow Creek, really. I mean, I, okay, this is personal. I think you're the apple of his eye. And I'm going to tell you why. This is just, I, I, it's, it's a little personal, but it, it's, it's also big picture. I think that Willow Creek is the apple of God's eye because this church was founded to reach lost people. And God so loved the world. God so loved the world. And, and the, the, you, you, you were birthed to make a difference. You were birthed to be salt and light. You were birthed to, to share faith. You were birth, birthed to help people come into the kingdom. And I'm just so excited because I believe that this is a new season. I believe it's a new season for you. I believe it's a, a, it's a fresh start. It's, it's a, a new beginning. And as I think of Celebration of Hope, I think of it as a three-week kind of a series, but I think of it more as a, as a way of life, of who not only you have been, but who to a greater degree you are going to become. And I've just got to tell you that um, I'm excited for where you are, and I'm excited about Dave and Rachel being here. I just love these. The, these the, do you realize these are great kids? Do you realize that? I mean... I'm so excited that they're here. And, and, yeah, they're kids. I'm sorry. I, when you're my age, they're either children or grandchildren. You've got to understand that. And, and I, I, when, when I've spent time with them, their love for God, their love for each other, their love for people, and their love for you just absolutely stands out in every way. And with Dave, he's, he's had such a beautiful track record. He's a wonderful proven leader. And as I was sharing with him the other day, he was, he's so excited about your future. And he's also so grateful for the past. He's so grateful for the foundation that's been laid. He's so grateful for the incredible facilities you have. He's so grateful for the mission of reaching lost people that you ever had. And he just is so ready to, to lead you into this next, this next session, this next level, this, this next season of, of your life. And I just, I just want you to know this, okay? I, all right, I'm going to preach in a moment. Just give me another moment. Just give me another moment. Because, you know, when you're a kid and you're excited, you just got to, you got to get your excitement out of you. And then, then I'll become a father figure and teach, okay? Yeah. So, so it's, it, it's coming. Just give me another moment. I, I just want you to know two things. The church world is rooting for you. The church world is rooting for you. Around the world, they are rooting for you because you have been a front runner. You've been a, a model, you've been an example. You've been a pattern for tens of thousands of churches around the world. And they're just rooting for you to have a, the greatest comeback, great season that you've ever had. But let me also just say to you, I know a fact that God is rooting for you. And I just want you to feel special because you are special. So why don't you just give God a hand and just thank him for the fact that you're the apple, you're the apple of his eye. You're the apple of his eye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In fact, I, I know, I know, I see you with those masks on, but I see your smile. You can't hide your smile. It's showing in your eyes. Look, look, look at your neighbor and just say, we are the apple of God's eye. Go ahead and tell them that. Just, just, just tell them that, okay? Now, now I'm, re I'm ready to teach if they'll just bring me a bottle of water. I forgot to bring my water. Just, just toss it right up to me. And let, let me just oh, see. Dave does not trust my ability. <laughs> did you, did you, did you, wait, did you notice this? I said, toss it up to me. Because I thought, I'll show everybody how I can catch and my athleticism of formal days. And Dave and his wisdom said, I will hand carry this to you, elderly father, and, and make sure that you don't fumble and mess it up. 
I was 17 years of age when Jesus changed my life. Three days later, I was reading a verse of Scripture before I went to school. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, they, they pass away, and, and behold, all things, and they, they become new. And I can still remember that day as I, I walked to school as, a, as a, a kid in high school. I, I just realized that my life had been changed, that I had been um, transformed, that, that I, I became that day what I would call a transformation carrier. I carried the good news with me that Jesus can change lives. Now, as I matured, I realized that that took a responsibility of, of being a, a changed person meant that I was to be able to do my very best effort to change others and to share the good news with others and, and, and to be salt and light. And, and so I transitioned in my growth from a transformation carrier to a, to a transformation caster. I began to look for every opportunity I could to, to let people know that, that God loved them and had a plan for their life and, and, and cared for them unconditionally and valued them to a great extent. And at that young age, I, I just knew that I wanted to change my world. And I didn't know how to change my world, but I knew it, I wanted to. I, I wanted to make a difference. I really didn't know how to make a difference, but, but I knew this, that my passion for what God had done in my life was going to spill over to the lives of others. Now, as I grew and matured, I realized that I wasn't the only person that wanted to change my world, that other Christians were having life change personally, and, and because of that, they were wanting to pass it on to others. And then I realized that Jesus, Jesus taught this incredible change your world message. And I'm going to start with it. It's in Matthew chapter 5. It's out of the message, and, and you can follow with me on the screen. Here's what Jesus says to us. Let me tell you why you're here. Now, now let me just stop here for a moment, okay? People all the time say, John, I'm looking for my purpose in life. Well, well Jesus is just now about to give you your purpose in life, Okay? So, so when people say, well, I'm just trying to find out what God wants me to do. Well, I, I've got good news. You're just about to find out what God wants. In fact, look at your neighbor and just tell them, you're just about to find out what God wants in your life. Go ahead and tell them that right now. You're just about to, okay, it, it, let's go. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here to be a salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. And if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? you lost your usefulness, and will end up in the garbage. And then Jesus says, well, let me tell you another thing. Here's, here's another way to put it. I, I not only want you to think of salt, I want you to think of light. You're here to be light. Bringing out the God colors in the world, and God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill, and if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I put you there on the hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house, be generous with your lives, and by opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. Jesus says that we're to be salt and we're to be light. Salt makes things better. Light things, makes things brighter. In other words, Jesus is saying that you and I are to have a positive impact upon the lives of other people, that we are to be contagious, that people are to look at our lives and, and see our good works and, and see our faith and, and, and be attracted to it, and that we're to season things and, and we're to brighten things with, with our life. He calls us, he calls us to, to be catalyst for good news, positive change. Now, when we think of change, we realize that the change isn't easy for people. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for you. In fact, in my leadership world, I used to think that leaders liked change and, 
and followers didn't like change. And then one realized, one day I realized, leaders don't like change either, they, unless it's their idea. But, 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 but the reason we don't like change is because it brings us out of our comfort zone a little bit. Let, let me illustrate here real quickly. Just, just cross your arms with me, would you please? This is good. Just everybody cross your arms, okay? Now, 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 let me just tell you, what you're doing right now, you've done thousands and thousands of times, so have I. And by the way, every time we cross our arms, you do know, don't you? We do it the same way. Every time. You know, there's two ways to cross your arms. But you only do it one way. And when you do it the other way, you feel uncomfortable. Go ahead. I mean, as soon as you do it, you want to go right back, don't you? You, you want to go back to the right way, the right way. Oh, uh, hey, fold your hands. Oh, now we just almost get spiritual, don't we? Now, when you fold your hands, you've done this thousands of times. You and I, when we do it, we do it the same way every time. There's another way to fold our hands, but we always do it the very same way. And, and, and the, this is the comfortable way. And if we do something we're not used to doing, it gets uncomfortable. That's right. Let's take and move over one finger. Now clasp those hands. Ooh. We're not even sure God can hear our prayer if we do this. <laughs> oh my, I, I'm not even sure. I'm not even, well, he, can he hear me pray like this? Now I'm just sharing with all of us that all of us are taken out of our comfort zone and, and, and we at times become uncomfortable. And I have found that we change, you and I, I change, we change when four things happen. When we hurt enough that we have to, when we see enough that we're inspired to, when we, when we learn enough that we want to, and, and, and when we receive enough that we're able to. And celebration of hope is about those four things. Celebration of hope is to reach out to the hurting, who are just desperately wanting to see change within their life, positive change, gospel change, good news change. It's all about being an example and, and being an, an inspiration for others to want to make that change. It's all about sharing the good news so they learn enough that they want to change. And it's all about the resources that we pour in their hands and in their lives that give them the ability to make that change. But when Jesus said we were to be salt and light, there was an assumption. The assumption was that we were salt and light. You see, transformation doesn't begin in others. It begins in me. It's, it's my life change that makes me positively contagious to others that would like to have their life change. You, you cannot give what you do not have. And so I need to be salt. I need to be light so that I can help others have a life change. In 1995, after 25 years of pastoring, I crossed over. I, I was writing books as a pastor, and they were leadership books trying to help pastors learn how to lead. I mean, pastors are just good theologues, but, but I didn't have any leadership training. And I, I've got three degrees, and they never taught me how to lead, and so I'm trying to write to help pastors how to lead. But what I didn't know is that the secular community was reading my books. And one day, my publisher in Nashville just gave me this huge surprise. He said, John, we find out two-thirds of your books are, are read by secular people. I said, you're kidding me. I had no clue. But at that moment, I felt called. I mean, at that moment. I felt called to make a switch, to a transition. I, I felt called to, to leave the pastoral ministry and go into the evangelism, secular ministry. I, I, I felt called to, to go and, and cross over and to become salt and light in that world. And so I began to ask myself a very basic question. If I'm going to go over there and be salt and light in that world, how do I pull that off? How do I make that happen? Okay, are you ready? I'm gonna share with you four things right now. Hang on, you get ready to take notes. I'm gonna share with you four things right now that will help you to become salt. How many of you? How many of you want to be salt and light? Let's see those hands. How many of you really want to be salt and light? <laughs> huh? I mean, I really, I, really want to, I really want to make a difference. I really want to add value to people. I'm going to give you four ways to do it right now. And here's what, here the good news is. Every one of you can do these four things. Okay? They're all simple. 
I, I'm a communicator, not an educator. An educator takes something simple and makes it complicated. <laughs> communicator takes something complicated and makes it simple. Okay. I put the cookies on the lower shelf. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. If you want to be salt and light, number one, value people. And beside that little phrase, value people, put one more word, connecting. It's in valuing people that we connect with people. This is huge. Our connecting link with lost people is that we truly value them. And if you want to be like Jesus, if you, if you follow Jesus in the Gospels, the conclusion you, you come to after those four books is that Jesus greatly valued people and he greatly valued everyone. Everyone. In fact, the only thing that bothered the religious people about Jesus is he valued some people that they didn't value. And he hung around with sinners and, 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 and people that, that they didn't want to hang around with. And, and Jesus, just he just valued people. And I think the, the core of his valuing people is found to us in Matthew 25. So I'm going to read these next verses, 35 through 40. They're back on your screen again. Here's what Jesus says. I was hungry and, and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, people like you and me, we're going to say, we're going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling you the solemn truth that whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Jesus values people so much that when we add value to them, he takes it personally. Don't miss this. I have people all the time come and say, John, I just wish I was closer to God. Oh, I can help you in a heartbeat. I, in fact, I can help you today become closer to God. It's very simple. Understand that when you add value to people, when you, when you visit and clothe and, and feed when you do all these things that Jesus just talked about, he said, you do them to me. If you really want to get close to Jesus, just get close to people that are hurting. In fact, every day I hug Jesus. Every day I, I serve Jesus. Every day I, 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 I give to Jesus. It's, it's every time I add value to that person and make a difference like celebration of hope, it, I'm doing it unto him. Now, this is huge. Now, now, stay with me. This is good. My perspective toward others detend, de determines my attitude toward them. H how I see you determines my attitude toward you. And, and this is a miss in the Christian community so many times. We, we, if, if, I, if I don't see you through the eyes of Jesus... If I don't unconditionally love you, if I don't, my father gave me the greatest advice I ever had when I graduated from college and started my ministry. He said, John, if you'll do these three things every day, he said, your ministry will be very fulfilling. He said, every day, value people, believe in people, and unconditionally love them every day. Value them, believe in them, and unconditionally love them. And every time I write a book, I, I write it through that grid. Every time I teach a lesson, I teach it through that grid. So if I see you as weak, I'll help you. And if I see you as broken, I'll fix you. And by the way, it's important to help and fix. These are good things. This, this isn't bad. But if I see you, don't miss this. If, if I see you as weak, I'll help you. If I, I see you as broken, I'll fix you. But hang on, don't miss this part right here. But if I see you as valuable, I'll serve you. Did you catch the difference? When I see you as valuable, when I truly value you, I will begin to serve you. Which brings me to the second way to be salt and light. 
The second way to be salt and light is to add value to people. And, and beside that phrase of adding value to people, put the word influencing. When we add value to people, we influence them just like when we value people, we connect with them. I had the privilege of leading the largest coaching company in the world, the John Maxwell team. And they're from all over the world, 40,000 coaches from 170 some countries. And when they come together for their training, when we teach them what we call John Maxwell team DNA, one of the first things we teach them is that we are people of value who value people and add value to them. That's who we are. That's who you are. That's who Jesus said you are. He said, you're salt, you're light, you're a person of value. Then what did he say? Value those people and add value to them. The Apostle Paul is such a model to me in this area. Because the Apostle Paul understood that when he values people, he serves people. And he understood it so well that he gives us what I call a real blueprint of, of celebration of hope, a real blueprint of how I can connect and how I can make a difference in people's lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 19 through verse 23, it's back on your screen. Here's what Paul said. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily Become a servant to any and to all in order to reach a wide range of people. And Paul doesn't want us to miss those wide range of people, so he tells us religious, non-religious, meticulous, moralist, loose, living, immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I, hang on, entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. And I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all of this because of the message. I just didn't want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. The Apostle Paul said, the way that I value people is I serve them. And I do it in a very intentional way. I personally have found this to be so true in my life. I, I, many years ago, I, I basically said, how do, I, how do I really do what Paul does? And I, and I just came up with a little simple daily deal that I do. I'll give it to you quickly. Every day, every day I value people. That's where it starts. That's the foundation. If you don't value people, you won't add value to them. That's just a fact. So every day I value people. But every day... I also think of ways to add value to people. And every day I look for ways to add value to people. And every day I do things that add value to people. And every day I encourage others to value people. This is just a simple five-step process that I do. It's a daily process in helping me to kind of do my best to, to follow out how Paul understood servanthood and how he realized that that when he could enter their world and see things from their perspective and and have a heart to care and, and, and share and give. You see, celebration of hope, it really didn't start with Willow. I mean, it's been a great tradition here, but the Apostle Paul started that. He's just kind of like your grandfather of celebration of hope. So how do I become salt and light? I've given you two things, two ways to do it. Here's the third way to become salt and light. Live good values. And beside the phrase live good values, put the word attracting. Because what happens is when I begin to live good values, people begin to be attracted to that type of a life. People do what people see. So I'm going to go back again one more time to another scripture Galatians chapter 5, you understand that immediately. We're now in the chapter that has the fruit of the Spirit. It's on, it, it, it's on, on your screen. The fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all of its varied expressions. In other words, as, as Paul is writing here, he says, now let me, let, me, let me show you what divine love looks like. I'm going to give you now some expressions of divine love so I can 
flesh it out for you so that you know how to live it, that you know how to model it. And then he begins to give these expressions of divine love that are within us because of the Holy Spirit. Here's what he says. It's, it's, it's joy that overflows. Let me just stop here. How many of you like to be around somebody joyful? Huh? And if, it, it, don't you just love to be around somebody that has the spirit of joy within them? Huh? It's, it's joy that overflows. It's peace that subdues. It's patience that endures. It's kindness in action. It's faith that prevails. Gentleness of heart. Strength of spirit. These are beautiful values. These are beautiful qualities that we have within us that we're to live out. Now, don't miss the last sentence. I never heard anybody speak on this last sentence, but I think it's the, I think it's the key to everything. Look what Paul says. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are met to be limitless. Paul said, I want you to know don't, don't ever get this legalism stuff in, in, in this game. He said, I want you to know these qualities, these values have no limits to them and, 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 and don't, don't dilute them by, by legalism. Just let people live these life because they have no limits at all to them. And number four, if you want to be salt and light, share good values. Share good values with others. And, and this is where transformation really happens. But before I, I get into that transformational part for a moment, did, did, you, did you notice there was a common word in becoming salt and light? Value people, add value to people, live good values, share good values, value, 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 value. In 2001 in America, we had a, a trust crisis because corporate America was just not treating people correctly and all I've got to do is say the word Enron. And all of you remember the, the crisis that we had, the breach of, of trust and ethics. I, I was writing for Time Warner at that time and they asked me to come to New York City. We had a meeting and they asked me to write a book on business ethics. And, and I said I couldn't and they said why? I said because there's no such thing as business ethics. <laughs> and they, they said, well, what, what do you mean? And, and, and they started going all over this, this corporate misbehavior stuff, and I let them go for a little bit, and, and I, I raised up my hand. I said, no, no, there, there's no such thing as business ethics. And they looked at me and said, then what would you call this? And I smiled and I said, ethics. It's just ethics. And if you have ethics, they work in business. <laughs> oh, happy day. And then they said, they said, well, John, can you, can you write a book on this? And I said, well, I'm not sure, because in the culture that we live in, without any truth or absolutes in some people's minds, how can, I mean, how can, you, how can you write about ethics? But our writing team and research team went together, and, and a month later I said, I'll write the book. And I wrote the book based upon the golden rule. Treat others as you would like to be treated. And the reason I wrote it on that is because every religion in the world, every culture in the world has a golden rule. And I knew I was safe. I knew I, I was going into a territory where that people understood that they could hold on to. But that was life-changing for me. That was the day my life made a major pivotal turn. Because when I wrote that book and I began to see the lives that were changed when they started to follow the golden rule, all of a sudden it hit me that if you would just teach good values, if you could live good values, if you could share good values, that it would begin to bring transformation. I wrote a book that just came out a couple of weeks ago called Change Your World. And it was the book I was born to write, but the seed of Change Your World happened 20 years ago when I began to understand that if we could, if we could help people learn, receive good values, that if they would learn them and, and live them, that, that they would become more valuable to themselves, they would become more valuable to others. And so when I wrote the book, Change Your World, I started off with this, with this phrase, and it just fits Celebration of Hope so well. Hope has two beautiful daughters, and their names are Anger and Courage. 
anger at the way things are, but courage to not let things stay as they are. Augustine of Hippo, that was his words, that was his quote. And there's something about hope that, that just springs eternal in people's lives. And, 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 and so we began to start several years ago now in other countries of, of teaching good values. We, we were invited by the president of Guatemala to come in there and, and, and we went to all eight mountains or streams of influence and, and we got buy-in to teach values in small groups. And, and, and we've been just doing this now for almost 10 years. And we've seen over two and a half million people go through small transformation tables, learning values. And I, I, just want to, I just want to stop for a moment and say that it's so exciting when you find something that works. Remember, I started this message by saying all of us want to make a difference. All of us want to change our world. All of us want to be salt and light. But we're not always sure how we can do it. When I was in school, when the teacher was getting ready to ask a question, the, the smart kids would raise their hands and then there were the rest of us. I, 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 I wasn't at the top of my class. I didn't have time to be at the top of my class. I um, had friends, social relationships, and played ball. And, and class was kind of like third on that level. And so when the teacher would ask a question, there were a lot of times I didn't have an answer. And so when, the, when the, she, she would look around the room to find, I, I would, I would kind of lay back down here and just kind of, you pray this too shall pass. <laughs> but there were times, there were times, a few occasions where I knew the answer. And when I really knew the answer, I wanted to get credit for it. You know what I'm talking about? And I'd raise my hand. I'd, but I mean, I would raise my hand. I mean, I would raise my hand and, and this hand would not be denied. It wasn't just this. It was. Please call on me. I may not be able to do this for a couple of weeks. Please call on me. I know the answer. I know the answer. Can I just say something? What I'm sharing with you right now is I, I, I got my hand in the air. I got in my hand. I, I, I don't know the only answer, but I know one of the answers to bring hope to people's lives. And that is to share with them good values. Good values is probably, when people learn and live good values, it's the it's the last step. It's pre-evangelism. It's, it's almost the last step probably before they receive Christ. And here's what we've discovered. That good values, what they do is they create stability in people's lives. You see, uh, good values makes us bigger on the inside before we become bigger on the outside. They, they, they make us better on the inside before we become better on the inside. They give us that inner core. That's what they do. You see, an empty bag, an empty bag doesn't sit up straight. Just a little wind and it falls over, a little bit more wind and it's totally blown away. And, and, and we have found that transformation begins on the inside and it begins with values. Recently I read that 81% of the people under 30 at least one day a week feel either anxious, depressed, lonely, or hopeless. Now you have to understand we've written curriculum for kids. We have over a million and a half children right now in public schools that are taking our values curriculum. Now, no, no, don't miss this, don't miss this. And here's what we found. Better values on the inside. With social media, kids are so much seeking approval. When, uh, when a person has better values on the inside, they, lead, they need less validation on the outside. And when we don't have values on the inside, we seek more validation on the outside. And we do this, we teach these values through small Groups. In fact, I have a chapter in Change Your World book that says transformation happens one table at a time. You see, it's at the table where everyone helps everyone improve. There are three questions people ask when they, when they need leadership and when they need help. And the three questions they ask is, do you care for me? Can you help me? And can I trust you? And those three questions, can you help me? Do you care for me and can I trust you? Those three questions are best answered in, in small groups, in round tables. 
I was doing a, a communication digital product with Steve Harvey the other day. He's just truly the funniest person I know. And we had so much fun. We, I mean, it was, it, and the cameras kept rolling, and we, we taught how to communicate, how to connect with people. We laughed, we cried, we had the best time. And, and in, the midst, in the midst of all this, all of a sudden, Steve said something that he described to me. He said, John, he says, your career is what you get paid for, but your calling is what you were made for. And can I just say something? We were all called. On all, of our, on all of our Willow campuses today, let me talk to you for a moment. You and I, we were all called to be salt and light. We were in one of our schools where they were using our values curriculum, and we were just going through the school, visiting kids. I went to a third grade class, and I sat there and asked questions because these kids had been learning the values in the classrooms and in small groups again, in, in little tables. And a, a third grader named Ethan stood up and he said, Mr. Maxwell, I have a question to ask you. And then he, he, he got quite dramatic. He put his hand on his heart. He said, Mr. Maxwell, he said, right here, right here, Mr. Maxwell, do you, do you ever feel like you would like to make a difference in people's lives? Do, do you feel it right here? And my heart went out. That little guy I said, Ethan, you come on up here. And he came up and he sat on my lap for a moment. I hugged him and, and I said, Ethan, I, I want you to know you're going to, you're going to make a difference in people's lives. And, and, and the whole class kind of plotted. And you see, Ethan, Ethan describes something that every one of us feel right down, right down here somewhere. We want to make a difference. We really want to be salt and light. We really want to add value to others. So I close with this verse. Romans 15, 1, strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? How can I help? When Matt was leading worship this morning, beautiful worship today, beautiful worship. But when, when Matt was leading worship and he stopped and he talked to us for a moment, he spoke about the fact that maybe the most important thing that we can ever say to God is, here I am. Here I am. And I thought how, how solid that is, how, how right on target that is. And as you work through celebration, I hope for the next three weeks at Willow, I, I just want you to have that spirit of here I am, God. I, I'm here and, and I want to make a difference. If you want to get the book Change Your World, if you just go to changeyourworld.com, you not only can get the book there, but you get a, can get a free assessment where we, we do a values assessment to help you understand what your values are. Tens of thousands of people have already taken it. It's free for you. And we also give you free material to start a transformation table based on values. It's all free. It's all free. Just to serve you, to add value, to help you. But I would like to close in prayer now. And I'd like to pray the prayer that Matt talked about. A uh, here I am prayer. Would you pray with me? Jesus, you already have given us our purpose. We're here to be salt and light. That's who we are. That's who you called us to be. That's who you want us to be. And we just want you to know that we're here. And we just lift our hearts and our hands up to you and we just say, yes, God, we, we are ready. We are ready during these next three weeks to, to be challenged like we've never been challenged before to make a difference. Thank you, God, for this incredible congregation. Thank you, God, for how you have used it for decades. It's been a salt and light, change your world congregation. And you've honored it and you've blessed it. And I pray for Dave and Rachel and the, and the team and the elders and the people. I believe this is going to be a, a new season, a new day, a fresh start. That they're going to reclaim and take that calling and be the leader that you would have them to be. And may it start with individual members of this local congregation. In Jesus' name, And everybody said,
Amen. God bless you. I love you. Thank you.